Hey all you gauchos and gauchettes out there, I got a pistol you've seen before on this channel, but I'm going to the history of this one because too many times I think people kind of um, just disregard any firearm if it wasn't knownly used, and particularly by the country they're in, and particularly in a major conflict like World War II, World War I, Vietnam, Korea, and so forth. I'm talking about from a very... Um, American, and by American I mean North American, um, or specifically United States of America point of view. Um, you can't separate yourself when you're Canadian, because we're pretty much the same. Like it or not, guys, we're all pretty much the same. Uh, so, what am I talking about today? Let me bring up my notes so I can tell you what I'm talking about today. Alright, so what are we talking about today? Um, well, I found the title of this article quite interesting, so I'm just going to steal it straight up. The Rise of Radicalism. Um, which sounds like I'm talking about today, but I'm talking about 1900. And I'm not talking about America, I'm talk well, or North America. I am talking about America, but I'm talking about South America. And the country in particular I'm talking about is Argentina. So, this is the part I like about firearms, which is they're not always about an individual pistol. Um, what they are sometimes is a snapshot of history. And you have to ask yourself, uh, why did that government order X number of, well, in this case, 1911s? So this is an, uh, going to the top view here for you. This is uh, 1911, built in 1915. The grips are replaced. Uh, pretty much everything else is original. Some parts have been upgraded, like the uh, has the length in 1927 liter from the uh, M. 1911A1. This is an M1911. So the video is not going to be 100% about the pistol, but it's going to be answering the question, why did Argentina order these in 1915? The short answer is there is no short answer. The long answer is um, most people will know Argentina has a rather uh, storied history when it comes to um, their, their government, civil unrest, and so forth. And in 1900, there was a strong push um, against communism uh, and fascism, as you can tell. It had to do with a lot of what was going on in Europe in particular, and it had to do with the Roca government that was in charge of Argentina in the early 1900s. What they were doing uh, were handing out... Um, well, what's... What culminated in, an, in a massive uh, civil strike, uh, general strike, and the Roca government was handing out contracts to European countries to build infrastructure, um, but the problem was the government was getting huge kickbacks and the interest rate on the, the projects that the, that the European countries, particularly Russia um, and, and, uh, and other countries, were investing into Argentina. The government was getting a huge kickback. In return, they were getting huge bills that the people were expected to pay. So that didn't last too long. And around um, 1919, so nearly 20 years of it, sounds like a long time, uh, but it started, uh, the government stayed in charge for uh, a period of time to about 1916. And then you had uh, elections and, and a lot of disruption going on. This led to um, an, a, a strike developing. So, the Sima tra Tragita, uh, the, the, the week, the tragic week. Let's see here. Sorry, guys, I'm going to pause for a second. Okay, so basically what happened in uh, 1919, there was a metal factory uh, in southern Brazil, or southern Argentina, not Brazil. Sorry, guys, if you live in Brazil, that was that's just me being tired. Uh, I'm not that stupid yet. Um, they had a conflict with their employers over um, wage increase. They wanted eight-hour workdays as opposed to 12 or however long they were, you were told to work for. Um, they wanted to bring workers back that had been fired for um, basically trying to form unions and stuff like that. Uh, and uh, they didn't want to be paid piecework, so for every... It's a metal... I don't know what they were making specifically, but they were making parts, and they were paid per part as, a, as opposed to per hour or salary. Um, pretty common things nowadays, but 
Uh, when you have a very strong um, corrupt government involved, uh, they'll always be on the side of the person who gives them more money. Who better than the people owning the company to pay the government to, off to, to get what they want so they can line their pockets a bit more. Um, it's, it's a cautionary tale as old as business, right? I mean, I'm sure you can find it in the Bible. And if you can interpret cave writings, I'm sure you'll find it there too. Basically, the, the, the one percenters stepping on the 99 percenters to make their living. So, this started, and the, the owners of the factory weren't too happy about it, so they called in some favors of the police and the local uh, government, and they came in, and guess what they did? Uh, they killed seven of the people working there, uh, and injured quite a few. Word got out to other um, uh, employees and employers uh, what was going on, and that's when you started getting general strikes. So you had people from the maritime workers, metal workers, shoe workers, tanners, tobacco workers, and transport uh, were, were all added to this um, general strike, which was starting to hit the country pretty hard, and the results of the corruption started becoming very obvious. So, for example, um, during the day, this is 19, um, 1919 money, so it would cost you 90 cents for a dozen eggs, and by the end of that same day in 1919 when these general strikes started, those eggs were now at around $5 a dozen. So it became pretty desperate pretty quick, and starvation was a real possibility, and you either go back to work and keep living, or you could start rioting, which is exactly what they did, and it got pretty nasty. Well, it got very nasty. So, on uh, January 8th, there was an uprising, and the police opened fire on, on some workers and killed them. January 9th, they actually had a large funeral procession, public funeral procession, uh, in the south of um, um, Buenos Aires. All these, all these riots were taking place in Buenos Aires, in case I forgot to mention. Um, and what ended up happening was that was the time the politicians decided we're going to show our, our muscle at a funeral of all things. So, bruh. And they called in the police and they called in the military and that's where this pistol would have come into play. Um, originally, these were ordered um, by the Roca government, but didn't really get there until this whole conflict started to develop um, and the Roca government was already gone at that point. But these were, would have been armed in the military and particularly cavalry. Cavalry really, you know, liked the idea of semi-automatic pistols. Uh, if you look throughout history, that's really what, what the driving factor of these guys is to be able to be on horseback and operate a pistol single-handed and reload. Good luck with a revolver, right? Or a single shot. So those guys came in, and that's when these pistols started to get to use. Um, they open fired on the protesters, killing 50 of them. At which point, the protesters just kind of erupted in all-out violence, and um, a mini-war was kind of on. Um, the army stepped up its 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 charge even more uh, from Campo de Mayo, um, and put down the, the uprising. The number I got from the Argentinian articles say 700 people were killed. Uh, I doubt those numbers simply because they're not. There's no source as to where those numbers came from, other than word of mouth or possibly newspapers. Um, and I think it was much higher because what ended up happening, uh, maybe there was 700 killed on those first couple days, but the killing didn't stop on those first couple days. It continued for quite a while after. Because what ended up happening was um, the general public was upset and they wanted somebody to blame. And of course, they weren't going to blame themselves. So they decided to blame anarchists and communists, and that's what made it into the paper, into the um, into the newspaper. It, it was they, they started blaming those groups, and so there was an active hunt put on to find those people. So in short, if you were Russian, you were a communist, um, and if you were Jewish, you were an anarchist. And according to the United States Embassy of the time, they believe fifteen hundred people were killed in the riots. As a result, and 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 the um, and the roundup afterwards uh, by the civilians and the military 
to to you know scapegoat people and the exact quote was um mostly russian and generally jews uh end quote was from the embassy 1500 mostly uh russians uh and generally jews and that many women were raped during this this whole nasty um trial there so long and short is just because you have a pistol that built in 1915 and lived its life in south america does not mean it did not see conflict and did not have a history of its own worth noting but let's go on to uh this pistol in particular we'll do a little bit about it i have done other videos comparing this 1911 to airsoft 1911 so uh, i would highly recommend check that out if you like 1911s and you can't get one in the country you're in and that's getting to be a lot more countries um, also, there's a cost factor involved too, right? These things, not super expensive. I mean, compared to a modern pistol, they're kind of on par. They're about $1,000 if you can find them. Um, if it was a government model um, for U.S. Army, it would probably be closer to 2000 So it's a nice foot in the door, as you would probably say. So let's look at this pistol here. So these were um, contracted in 1914. Uh, the contract was fulfilled by 1915. All these pistols will be dated, um, well, they don't have the date on them, will date to 1915. Uh, there was, let's get the close up here. You can see the serial block number there. Let me get one little pointy. There's a serial number there. It starts with a C for a civilian. 206. Uh, 20. 868, sorry guys. Okay. Hard to read in this light. So much of it is kind of glaring. Um, so yeah, so civilian contract block number, which kind of makes sense. That's any country who ordered these things would get into a civilian uh, prefix. Uh, 20068, so the contract started in 2000 and they ordered a thousand of them. So it's a smack in the middle. Um, if you're outside of the serial range, does not mean it's not a proper Argentinian gun. But there's a possibility that someone swapped a slide um, with the frame, so check your numbers. Um, there was orders, separate orders that went to the Marine, um, Marine at, not Marines, but as in the Navy. Uh, they'll be marked Marine somewhere on there, uh, or with an anchor. Uh, government model, so that's the obviously the 1911. And then you have your standard Colt markings, Colt Automatic Caliber 45. And you have your patent dates and information there. Nothing out of the ordinary. These are all straight factory markings. You have your inspector marks down here. Um, like I said, this grip safety has been replaced. Uh, you have the old rapid Colt at the back here, as opposed to up here on the, on the World War II 1912 guns. Um, you don't have the very earliest sight. You have the you have more of a square sight. The, the original sights were completely rounded. You do have a rather small blade on the front. The, the sight picture on this is, is um, quite horrible. The grips, like I said, have been replaced, but they would have been these checkered grips. Uh, so that's what I replaced them with. The ones that, when I got it, did not have the checkered grips. There is another marking on the top here. Let's see if I can show you that. It's a little tricky to see. Uh, get the like just right. So that's the best I can do for you guys. That's an Argentinian crest. And then that's an Argentinian um, uh, serial number they put on there. Or, or I guess I would call it a serial number because it's serialized. It goes one after the other. So this one is 868. Which I do believe is the last three digits of the serial number. So, uh, yeah, that was their own inventory mark. Uh these would have come with the dual tone magazines. Don't know how many it came with originally. Um, to be honest, these aren't the magazines that this gun came with. Uh, I was lucky enough at my local antique store, which you can find the link in my uh, on my uh, YouTube page. There uh, came in this rare, very rare British leather pouch. Uh, the pouch. And the magazines are probably worth as much as the pistol is, oddly enough. A um, little bit interesting side fact. Uh, I like talking about these guns in forms of 
pop culture. Um, the 1911, I'm not even going to get into it because the 1911 is pretty much the Andy Warhol of, of pop culture guns. It is everywhere and everyone. But this pouch is kind of interesting. Uh, if you want to, for those of you Star Wars fans out there like me, I'm a massive Star Wars fan. Uh, this is kind of the holy grail of your Jawa costume right here. So these were used on some of the Jawas uh, pouches. Problem is, when they did Star Wars, these pouches would have been like 30 years old and not particularly in demand. But now, good luck finding one, guys. So, just thought you'd like to see that. Uh, so it's two compartments. They're separated down the middle. This one's still in really good shape. Uh, so, yeah, keep an eye out for those if you see them. British uh, pouches for the 1911 magazines. And needless to say, there weren't too many 1911s being used by Brits. Uh, they like their Webley revolvers in World War One, Enfield uh, revolvers in World War Two, or the Browning High Power. Um, and I don't know if those would fit High Power magazines. Probably not. Uh, if you're Canadian carrying this thing, you'd put it in a canvas holster. Uh, there were some leather holsters made. So going back to this, uh, uh, there's not a whole lot to say about this. Uh, there was the Navy contract. There was a second contract for these. Uh, I think the most important thing about these was um, these are not the Argentinian built 1911s. Uh, these were the Modela uh, 16, or Model 16. Uh, that's a funny thing. I, I, I do do that, and I have a, I take issue even when I do it, which is pronounce Modela in Spanish and a number 16 in English. Um, I'm not that good with numbers in Spanish, so I don't know how to do it. But you do it with the Carcanos, right? They, they call it... I don't want to get into Carcanos. We'll, do, we'll get into that in another day. I haven't done that video yet. So, going back to this guy here... Um, yeah, don't confuse it with the 1927 version, uh, which is basically a star pistol. Uh, there's nothing wrong with it, uh, but just when it comes to collectability, if you like Colts, this is a Colt. This is a Colt manufactured in the U.S. And the funny thing about these Colts being manufactured in the U.S., which is um, there was some problems in World War II uh, with the government and Colt when it comes to supplies that uh, the guns weren't getting to the American troops uh, by 1917, and and uh, needless to say, Colt took the blame, and it was accused uh, one of the the employees who was in charge of distribution of sympathizing with the enemy and bringing all these nasty charges up against them. But the reality is, uh, Colt is a private company, and private companies are greedy and they want to make money, so they were busy filling contracts like this. Uh, and to other countries and selling to civilians at a much higher cost than they were to the government. So this is one of the reasons why the U.S. had a hard time supplying their own troops with 1911 because they were sending them to Argentina and other countries. Just thought I'd want to say that. it's There was no grand conspiracy about communism and, and socialism and fascism uh, taking over the Colt manufacturing company. It was just simply uh, a matter of I can make more money selling to other people than the government. Thought you'd like that. All right, so I'm going to call this quits for today, guys. I hope you enjoyed this video. It's a little bit different. I'm looking more into the history than the gun itself. And I would um, advise you to look into the history of all your pistols because it's a great um, key to, to finding out things you may not have known in the past. I mean, I didn't know a ton about... Um, Argentinian history, even though I had uh, quite a few Argentinian friends, uh, and I knew about the Falkland Wars and things like that, and uh, and, and more recent um, incidents taking place, but not as far back as 1900. Uh, the other key thing, too, I, I thought I should add as well before I say goodbye, um, the first coup took place in 1930, so this pistol would have been um, in use in 1930. The upgrades were done in the 19, late 1920s. Uh, possibly even into the 30s, but so this has been through a military coup uh, No doubt on the hip of one of those guys involved in the coup. So hope you enjoy it um, and Stay tuned for more videos about firearms and the past. Thank you guys. Please like and subscribe and I'll see you again <music>